now an undercover investigation into one of Britain's religious communities in a Dispatches special. Stamford Hill, home to Europe's largest strictly orthodox Jewish community, the Haredi. It's a closed world where outsiders are often treated with mistrust. Our investigation has uncovered shocking evidence of what this can mean for victims of child sex abuse. Our undercover filming reveals how some Haredi rabbis can explicitly forbid these victims from going to the police. Look, the police owns Canada, sure. Police uh, is not so You should only can lead to the police. We discover what can happen to those who do choose to report abusers to the police. The synagogues told them, you're not welcome here anymore. They would be cursed and spat at in the street and called informer. This film exposes how the Haredi approach to child protection leaves children at risk and shields abusers from justice. There are around 40,000 Haredim in Britain, around a sixth of the Jewish population, living by a strict interpretation of their faith as decided by their rabbis. And some of those rabbis say it is forbidden to report a fellow Jew to non-Jewish authorities. And this even applies to allegations of child sex abuse. Our investigation started a year ago when we heard parents were very concerned a man they believed was a child abuser had got a job in a Haredi school and they felt powerless to do anything about it. During our investigation, we uncovered 19 allegations of child sex abuse, yet not one had been reported to the police. People told us it was widely accepted that you go to the rabbis first for advice and that going to the police instead could have devastating consequences. They said they feared being cast out of the community, the only way of life they had ever known. And it's this fear which is keeping people from seeking justice. This man is a Haredi rabbi. In this film, he takes an extraordinary step. He's decided to break ranks and speak out against the most senior Haredi rabbi in London. He's outraged at how a young family was targeted after reporting that their child had been abused. The rabbi has chosen to remain anonymous as he fears reprisals. What is your understanding? What were you told about what happened to this little boy? The father is praying alone late in the synagogue, two o'clock in the afternoon. All of a sudden, in the middle of prayers, he looks round for his son. His son is gone. He gets very nervous. He runs out and sees his son being held by a man who quickly releases his hand. It wasn't until hours later where the son began to talk to the parents. He explained that the man started to slowly touch him, first on the stomach, then on the legs, etc., gradually touching him in the genital area. When the child's telling his mum and dad all this, I mean, what thoughts did the father say was going through his head? How was he reacting? The young man didn't know what to do. And out of desperation, he made the decision to call the police. To people outside, they'll be saying he believes his son was abused. Of course, go to the police. The repercussions of somebody going to the police, being labelled as an informer, it could affect the father's work opportunities. It could affect his social standing. It could affect the child in terms of who we will marry some 15 or 20 years later. Being labelled as an informer 
is one of the most terrible things that can happen. So after the father had complained to the police, I mean, something was done, wasn't it? The police felt there was enough evidence to take out the perpetrator from the middle of the Stamford Hill community in handcuffs. And this is disgraceful, a scandal. Why would he be driven by police car? And between telephone calls and emails, etc., most of the community knew about it that night, and whoever didn't knew about it in synagogue the next morning. It was quite clear that going to the police, in a sense, was pressing nuclear. Exactly. Then he went to the senior rabbi of the Stamford Hill community, Rabbi Padva. His whole total concern was to berate the father. How dare you go and be an informer? He said, you ruined his life. He was ashamed enough by the arrest and what happened, and therefore leave it. Go. It's forbidden for you to pursue the case. Rabbi Padva never expressed sympathy, not for the child and not for the parents. So after the father visited Rabbi Padua, and it was made clear to him what the rabbi's views were, what happened next? Six hours later, a person banged on the door. The first thing that man said, do you know that the whole London community has not slept the whole night because of what you did? And I myself will go and get social services to take away your children. The harassment escalated into cars that would gun their motors and zoom up next to the family if they were out on the street. The synagogues told them, you're not welcome here anymore. They would be cursed and spat at in the street and called informer. So it becomes hopeless to them. And ultimately they leave the country. As a rabbi within this community, do you feel shame for how this has been Of dealt? course, of course. L let's look at, at recent history. You have the payouts in the Catholic priest abuse scandals. There's a shame involved in this case, and many others have been buried, and it's an outrage, and I'm indignant. Yet, that's not a reason or an excuse to leave the faith. The religion works, and it is greater than any shortcoming. Can I ask you, on a personal note, as a rabbi, as a member of the community, advising this man to go to the police, was there any conflict for you? Was that a difficult uh, decision? There is no question here that we do not have the ability to police and deal with perverts, deviants, child molesters. We can't. It's above the pay grade of the rabbis. The rabbi I spoke to clearly identifies a fellow rabbi, Efron Padua, as someone who explicitly forbids victims of sexual abuse from going to the police. We'd also heard concerns about how Rabbi Padua had dealt with another report of child abuse and how he'd investigated the alleged abuser. Rabbi Padua leads London's strictly orthodox community in Stamford Hill, and when such a senior rabbi speaks, he's listened to even if that advice could seriously jeopardise any police investigation. So we wanted to find out for ourselves what advice the rabbi would give to someone who came to speak to him. This is Moshe C. He told us he was sexually abused as a child by a fellow Haredi. Like many cases of historic abuse, his case never went to court. We asked him to help us investigate the claims against Rabbi Padua, and we trained him to secretly film a meeting with the rabbi. Moshe has now left the community, but he could still meet the rabbi without raising suspicions. I've got a meeting at Padua at 11 o'clock. Until now, Moshe says he has never approached a rabbi about his claims of abuse. Yeah, hello. Do you want me to come in? Do you want me to come in? Okay. I've come to you, to be honest, about a very delicate issue. Oh, yeah. Uh, someone who did bad things to me when I was younger. 
someone who you may know of, who abused me, sexually abused me when I was younger, when I was a child. And I'm looking for your advice, to be honest, what to do. I think it's someone you might have dealt with in the past. Mm. I think it's someone you might have dealt with in the past. Look, uh, I imagine I know whom we are talking. And uh, if I'm correct, we are dealing with it. So. How, 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 how is it being dealt with? Under control. It's under control. Yeah. Are you are you involved in it with him? Mm. Are you involved in it in dealing with it? Uh, I was involved, but uh, would you think maybe is it is it a good idea to speak to the police about it? No. Why? It's a but this is a very serious issue. Yes, but not the police. Not the police. Sure. So when Rabbi Padua is asked here about going to the police, he says no, because it's Mazira. And this concept of Mazira means it's forbidden to report a fellow Jew to the non-Jewish authorities. And here Rabbi Padua is saying that applies even when you're talking about allegations of child sex abuse. Even, even if you think it may be happening to other people? No, no, no problem. not the police. And, um, how, 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 I mean, how can you reassure yourself that this man is not doing it to others? No, the police also can't, can't assume. The uh, police uh, is not assuming. Under no circumstances. Now I've got a question, if, if, if the police found out about it and they called me in, what would you, what would you say to me? Why is it? I thought we would do that. Colin, you should do anything to, could, what, what can lead to the police. But if, if someone else went to the police on him and I was called, what, what do I do then? Uh, Let's hope it not. Sorry? Let's hope it would not. Thank you very much. Thank you. That's quite unambiguous. By now, Rabbi Padua has said three times when asked about going to the police, no. But to be clear, there's no suggestion that there's any more child sex abuse within the Haredi community than there is anywhere else. But I think what people will find shocking is, here you have Rabbi Padua, a senior religious figure, someone people go to for help and guidance, saying do not report an allegation of child sexual abuse to the police. Dispatches is investigating how the Haredi community tackles child abuse. It's Hanukkah, the Jewish festival of lights, and a major event at this Haredi care home in Stamford Hill. Itta Simmons is a leading figure in the Haredi community and devotes her time to helping her fellow Haredim. As a Holocaust survivor herself, she's passionate about preserving the Haredi way of life. She fervently believes the community is best placed to deal with child abuse cases and has even been directly involved in dealing with some cases herself. After the celebrations, Itta agreed to explain her rationale. It's clearly very important for you to maintain the strength of the community. How would you say that impacts on, for example, the way that your community might deal with the issue of child abuse? As a community, we have the whole infrastructure from, from birth to death. So that covers all eventualities and all aspects of life and everything that happens in life. So obviously, unfortunately, things like child abuse, abuse would occur. 
But what we don't do, and that's what probably gets people upset, is the minute there's an allegation, go running to the social services. Because we've found that the social services are not sensitive at all, and they don't really help. Many people would say there's a point to social service rushing in, and that is to protect the children. Well, I don't agree with you, because if there's just the wildest allegation, and it might not even be true, uh, by making the child aware that possibly something awful has happened to him, you can actually damage the child. And in some instances, it's better to, rem to remove the situation that it doesn't get any further, if there's any sign of anything, and to deal with it in a discreet way, protecting the child. And that would be, in my opinion, and in the, com in the p opinion of greater people than myself. I mean, at what point would you judge, OK, we've tried to deal with it, the rabbis have tried to deal with it, we will call the police now. Uh, what, yes. what is the line that you cross? If the rabbis and counsellors and doctors and professionals can't deal with it adequately to protect the community, the community at large, then they certainly will bring in the authorities. And it, it's just not true that we don't, because we don't make you know big headlines out of every incident, or would-be incident. doesn't mean to say we don't respond to it. We certainly do. Would you like to see a change whereby people didn't need to ask to the rabbis, can I go to the police, that they had free will to go to the police if, if they've been abused, for example? No, I certainly would not. I do not think that it would bring any advantage to our community whatsoever. But can your community stop someone working with children or moving out of the community to a different part of the country and working with children no. there? Nobody can be sure about anything. You just can, you can stick a person into jail, you can put him on the register, and then he goes in another name and he goes to another place and, and he's at it again. Issa is the sort of person who illustrates how this community works at its best. She does huge amounts of voluntary work and has spent her whole life devoted to looking after the vulnerable. And yet she still has this unshakable belief in the fact that it's rabbis and community leaders who are best placed to decide, first of all, whether an allegation of child sex abuse is true, and then if it is, how to deal with the abusers. This man is Rabbi Osher Westheim, a senior Heredo rabbi based in Salford. We also received reports raising serious concerns about the way he's advising people who come to him saying they've been sexually abused as a child. We went back to Moshe C and asked him to secretly film Rabbi Westheim for us it would be the first time he would ever meet this man. We created a story for Moshe to put to the rabbi based on the various reports we have received during our investigation. We wanted to see what advice he would give. Basically, um, when I was younger, someone abused me when I was a child, sexually abused me when I was a child. That was back in London when I was younger. Now, I discovered, as far as I know, this person is now in Manchester, teaching in a school here in Manchester. What's your, what's your name? Moishi Yeah. What's the name? Of the person? Yeah. I'm a bit scared to say at the moment because I want to know what your advice is and what I should do. Uh, but I suspect it's a person from, about whom I've heard the same thing from somebody else. Despite being given very little detail, Rabbi Westheim says straight away, I think I know who you're talking about. So it seems quite clear that he's already involved in a case involving a teacher who's under suspicion of abuse, but still working in a school. But I've been given other names for people who might know more. So officially I'm in the middle of this, uh, investigating it. Right. Uh, when we investigate, we get, we get information until we're so sure that he won't be able to deny it. And then we, you know, when then we start sorting things out. In, 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 what, way, thing, in what way is it sorted out? First thing you'd have to get out of schools. That's the first thing. Out of schools. That's the first thing, right? Away from any 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 situation or anything with the kids. That's the first thing. And then he's going to have to get proper 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 professional help. 
So Rabbi Westheim says officially there is an investigation going on to allegations of child sex abuse, but he's the one doing the investigating. He's the one gathering evidence, not the police. And what I did, I can't promise I would be successful, but I got, I got compensation for, to, for, for the expenses they had for therapy. Mm. Yeah. From the person? Yeah. The person paid? £5,000 I got for one person. So Rabbi Westheim has talked about sorting it out. And what he's done in the past is he has effectively brokered a deal between the abuser and the victim whereby the victim gets compensation, £5,000 compensation for being abused. And that's the way it's been resolved. Look, I want to tell you, this person I'm thinking about, the moist that we're teaching here now are all sisters already, they're, they're suspicious. They, they've heard things, they are on, they're on the, let's call it orange alert, okay? Mm. They realise that there's a talk about him, yeah? But um, we've not, I've not been able to pin anything Definitely. So not only does Rabbi Westheim know about this person, but the school where he's teaching also has suspicions about him. The school's on orange alert, which begs the question, why is he still allowed to teach there? But it's got to be sorted out, because if it's true, for the sake of other kids, you've got, you got, you got to get him out. He's got to go and sell potatoes, but not, not teach kids. Do you think it's a good idea to go to the police? The problem with the police is that they can do things very wild and very stupid. So would you recommend it to me? Well, it, well I would have to think of what, how to go about it. I would have to think. But I can't as, a first, as a first step to go to the police? If you, if you want to go to the police, you know, they're perfectly entitled to. Now, pay Loha as well, you know what I mean? Because it's a danger. I've got to tell you, right, mm. that you want to go to the police, go to the police. I cannot say differently to you. Otherwise, I can I can end up behind bars. Mm. <laughs> What's that? But I think I think. Look, truthfully, Emma's you, sh you should go to the police. And that's it. If you think if you think it's going to help, you are to be pretty sure that's going to that's going to help. Rabbi Westheim is quite clear about what he's supposed to say. Of course, I must tell you, you can go to the police. I'd be put behind bars otherwise. But he also makes it quite clear that he doesn't necessarily think that the police are best able to deal with this issue. And if you're a vulnerable victim who goes to him for advice, you could quite easily be discouraged from going to the police. We've had cases where the most horrific, horrific abusers have been, there's been, the, the, the people signed, signed a paper, a police what to call it, a statement and everything, and the police did nothing. And said to them, well, what's the matter with you? He me call fuss about it and he'd done nothing at all. He got a fellow who was such an abuser, I, I said to them, I said, to call a guy a beast is an insult to beasts. <laughs> you know? And, and, and they did nothing. I said, go break and take his computer, you'll see it. No. That's why I hung all that much confidence that the police will really do anything proper. That's my, that's my hesitation. Okay, I'll think about it. Maybe I'll come back with the name. So it's a big decision for me, it's not so no, easy. I Okay. 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 A few months after the secret filming took place, we were told of some disturbing consequences of the Heredi approach. This young man says he was sexually abused as a child. But disillusioned with the failure of rabbis to deal with complaints of abuse, he and his friends have taken matters into their own hands. You could just begin by telling me a little bit about what happened to you when you were a young boy. He was a few years older than me, a kid from the neighbourhood. And one Friday night we were walking home together and we were walking past the synagogue when he told me he's got to go be excused. When he walked in, he just grabbed me, pulled me in, and he raped me. He was standing at the door, and I was trying to get out. He locked the door, and he was standing there, and I said to him, if you don't let me go out, I will tell people about this. So he was like, if you tell people, I've had it before. If you tell people, then I'll put the blame on you, and you'll regret it. So tell me about the first instance when you decided 
you would in effect seek justice as you saw it. Well, a friend of mine came over to me and said to me, did you get so-and-so out of town? I could see the way he was speaking. I could see he was going through what I'd gone through. So that's why I decided I was going to take the law into our own hands. Nobody was doing anything. And that's when we went round. That was on a Saturday night. We made him open the door and we beat him up. Again, in a way that there was no evidence of anything. I mean, what gave you the right to look at this evidence? You were judging a lot of it on hearsay. And yet you were going to, in effect, devastate this man's life. I mean, was that right? Well, I'll be honest. I thought seeing as the police wasn't an option and the rabbis won't do anything, I felt that we've got to do it ourselves. Most of the people in the community know us. We're a group of about eight or nine. They know that our threats aren't empty. They know that if we say something, we mean it and we'll carry it out. What convinces you that the rabbis are incapable of properly dealing with this? Once an allegation of rape goes against them, the abusers, very often the rabbi will take him out from his house, put him in a hotel somewhere, and they'll try and deal with it. Give it a couple of weeks, everything goes quiet again, and it's back to square one again. The victim still has to see the fellow every day. You know, no one's stopping them from keeping them apart. It can happen again. This was more than once, wasn't it? The first time we did it was when I was 15, which was that one. And then it has happened on a few occasions since. How many would you say? Probably 10 to 15 throughout the past few years. Have you ever tried to deal with your own abuser directly, physically, violently? Well, I'll be honest. I don't know what it is, but there's something stopping me. I can't walk over to him. I can't face him. I can't look him in the eye because he wrecked my life. I haven't had a normal day in my life since. What's clear from that is you've got people who don't feel they can go to the police, but at the same time they clearly don't believe that the rabbis and the people in authority in the community are capable of dealing with this situation properly. So what you're left with is groups of angry young men resorting to violence, in effect taking the law into their own hands. A few weeks later, Rabbi Westheim responded to what we found. We told Rabbi Westheim we had secretly filmed him discouraging someone who said he'd been abused as a child from going to the police. He told us he does not generally discourage people from taking their complaints to the child protection teams or the police, with whom he regularly works and liaises. He stated, in many cases concerning abuse, I have positively encouraged the participation of the authorities or spoken to them myself. He confirms that he does offer to mediate in some claims of abuse for those who seek redress, and that sometimes involves the accused person paying compensation. He also says that he has a fund to pay for therapy. But he insists that that is not in place of any formal investigation by the police or others. All options need to be considered. The rabbi concludes that he does his work with honesty and with faith. We also wanted to know whether the school rabbi Westheim mentioned had reported the allegations against this teacher to the local authority. A statutory guidance introduced in 2010 clearly states it should, as soon as the head teacher knows about them. So we asked Salford Council whether any Haredi school in its area had reported an allegation against a member of staff up until October 2012 a month after our secret filming. The answer from the council was no. In part three, how the Haredi community of New York came out in support of a man accused of child abuse. Dispatches is investigating the Haredi approach to child protection. I've come to New York, home to the largest community outside of Israel. Here, Haredi child sex abuse victims have become more willing to face their abusers. 
around 100 cases have ended in court since 2009. And at the moment, the most high-profile trial yet. A trial which puts the focus on the Haredi community like never before. An Orthodox Jewish leader is standing trial on charges he sexually abused a teen he was counseling. Step back. Step back. Step back. The Orthodox community turned out in droves, hoping to get a courtroom seat as a 17-year-old girl from Williamsburg pointed the finger at a well-known counselor named Nakania Weberman. He is now charged with forcing the then-adolescent to perform sex acts for the next three years. Five months before the trial was due to begin, something extraordinary took place. Over a thousand Haredim came out in support of Mr. Weberman at a high profile fundraiser in the heart of the community. Despite him facing 59 charges for abusing a girl from the age of 12, the event managed to raise half a million dollars towards his legal costs. Well, accusation doesn't mean he's, he's, he's guilty. He, has to, he needs the funds to defend himself. But in many ways, what was equally remarkable was that a small but determined group of Haredim were prepared to be seen openly supporting the victim in her decision to inform the police. Ben Hirsch runs a support group which has been instrumental in encouraging Haredi victims to take their abusers to court. He says the Weberman trial is a perfect illustration of just how challenging this can be. I think for most people it's an absolutely extraordinary idea that people would hold a fundraiser to raise money for a man who is allegedly, has been, has been accused of a huge number of offences against a child. This is not about Weberman himself so much as it's about sending a message to victims that if you do step forward and step outside the community with your allegations, if you go to the authorities, if you go to the media, we're gonna punish you. And we're gonna punish your family, we're gonna punish your friends. When funds are needed for something of an embarrassing nature such as this, the grand rabbi picks up the phone, or he has one of his people pick up the phone, make a few phone calls, reach out to a few wealthy people and say, we need X number of dollars for this situation. Keeping somebody out of jail is a very big ticket item. It's something that is very important to them. So raising $500,000 for something of this nature is done in a day with a few phone calls. So here at the moment, you're facing this hugely controversial and really public trial. Tell me about that. It's, it's in the limelight, which is wonderful. Um, the courage of the um, accuser is um, something that is very impressive, and her courage will hopefully um, be a... Um, it'll encourage other victims to step forward. They'll see her survive this process, they'll see the backing that she got, and hopefully they'll feel more secure coming forward. Do you think real change is on its way? One hopes that the long-term impact of a successful Weberman prosecution will be other victims seeing that it's possible to stand up to the rabbis. It's possible to stand up to this, this, this massive force. If that message gets out there, then the Weberman trial will have been um, revolutionary. I wanted to find out more about what motivated Weberman's supporters. Yossi Gestetner is a PR consultant who has repeatedly defended the controversial fundraiser. The idea of a fundraiser to raise money for a man accused of a, a significant number of serious sexual crimes... But I, I, don't, think, I don't think you want to hold it against um, the community or people in the community for uh, being willing to to give someone the benefit of the doubt the benefit of the doubt why do they not give the benefit of the doubt to the young woman who is claiming she was abused sexually abused by this respected member of the community for a number of years 
There are people who do believe that everybody should have a, 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 uh, a trial, a fair trial, and have the ability of a fair trial of the innocent until proven guilty. Isn't it quite possible that this fundraiser wasn't about raising money because you know that the money could have been raised very quietly. They didn't need this public fundraiser. But this is about sending a message about where the community stands. Here in the United States, if somebody accuses somebody else of a crime, the accuser can be anonymous. If there's no way to prove it later, then okay, the case is dropped and whatever, with no potential penalty for the accuser if they had bad um, motives. But in the meantime, the person who gets accused, he gets picked up, his name is in the paper, his family's name and finances is destroyed, he loses his job. Are you directly saying that this is better dealt within the community? If people need to choose between a society where more than half people, more than half sexual cases do not get to the authorities and doesn't get cared for at all, versus a society where rabbinical authority may uh, put pressure um, on, on a person accused of a crime to move away of an area or to change his lifestyle, I'd rather take the second one. The authorities here estimate there are currently about 50 child sex abuse cases from within the Haredi community awaiting trial. The verdict in the Weberman case would come through a month later. We're at Brooklyn Supreme Court and there is a guilty verdict today in the trial of the 54-year-old Orthodox Jewish counselor that we've been following, Nehemia Weberman. He's been convicted on all counts in the case involving a 12-year-old girl who came to him for help. The top count carries a maximum penalty of 25 years in prison. Eventually, Weberman was sentenced to 103 years. Welcome news for victims in America. But we're yet to see such a high-profile case here. At the beginning of our investigation, we secretly filmed Rabbi Padua, the leader of the Haredi community in Stamford Hill, forbidding a victim of child sex abuse from going to the police. We asked Rabbi Padua to explain his actions, and the Union of Orthodox Hebrew Congregations, the organisation he heads, sent us this letter. It says, The Jewish community considers the safety and protection of our children as paramount. It says we have established robust structures to deal with child abuse and that we work and will continue to work with police and social services to build trust and to create a system which does address and resolve allegations of abuse within our community. But it also says the authorities understand that unfortunately some in our community would simply not be comfortable participating in a police investigation. The letter doesn't answer any of our questions, and nor does it explain the actions of Rabbi Padua, a man whose very role it is to lead and counsel members of his community to do what's right. Days before our film was due to be broadcast, Rabbi Padua issued another statement this time aimed directly at his own community. It says that there is actually a special committee to deal with child abuse cases, called the Committee for the Protection of the Child and Determining the Method. Made up of rabbis and people within the community who are trained to tackle this issue, the statement went on to say that there were five instances when it would be right to go to the police or social services, though it didn't say what they were. Crucially, what the statement did say is that the final decision still lies with the rabbi. So the power remains with the rabbis to judge if someone has been sexually abused and whether there's a case to answer. But if there is, vital evidence for a police investigation could be lost while they come to that decision. And where's the justice in that? If you've been affected by issues raised, there's support available online at channel4.com slash dispatches.